Well, welcome everyone. Hi, my name is Jenny Whitener with Bridge Innovate, and it's exciting to welcome you to today's session, Building an Entrepreneurial Culture, Tips from a Turnaround Executive. So as we're getting started today, just want to give you a chance to say hello to our guest speaker, Jeff Cardell. If you would go into the chat, um, maybe introduce yourself by sharing your name and your organization as you're coming into today's program, Building an Entrepreneurial Culture tips from a turnaround executive. So we'll just take a few moments as people join the session today. Um, please do say hello to our guest speaker by going into the chat, maybe entering your name and your organization. That would be helpful. So I'll just start by saying hello, it's Jenny. And I know Jeff will probably do the same. There we go, great. So I see Steve coming in. Thanks so much, Steve. And as others join today, it's always helpful or using digital technology to know our audience. So thank you for going into the chat and saying hello to our presenter today as we get started. Today's session will be recorded. So keep that in mind as we go along. Bridge Innovate's program today is building an entrepreneurial culture, tips from a turnaround executive. So thank you guys for, as you're signing in today, share your name and your organization in the chat to say hello to our presenter, that'd be great. So let's get going. We have a lot to cover. So today, this program is being brought to you by Bridge Innovate. It's a part of our Inspire series, where we reach out to leaders across the world to share their inspirational stories around leadership, innovation, and organizational change. And it's exciting today for us to welcome Jeff Cardell to that speaking uh, team. Bridge Innovate focuses on building capability through business innovation structures and design sprints and organizational change uh, work. And um, we do that both on the innovation for growth side and the innovation for good side as we give back through our Bright Spark program and our Inspire series. So let's continue on. In terms of Bridge Innovate, we're committed to building partnerships on integrity. We believe in collective wisdom, and that's a lot of what our Inspire series is about, bringing in thought leaders from around the industry to share their perspective. We believe in human-centered design and in foresight, looking at future trends to be bold in our vision and strategies and in our innovation. And we've already talked about our innovation for good work. So let's get going. Today, today's program is going to be fantastic. It's with Jeff Gardell. He's a strategy and change leader and the president of Cardell Consulting. He has 25 years of experience in leading results-oriented portfolio improvement. So if you give him a company in trouble, he's going to turn it around. Um, he's been proving that for years. His background uh, in the old days is a Georgia Tech uh, graduate in mechanical engineering and then on with his master's program at the University of North Carolina. And then an amazing career with a number of very large scale corporations from Lockheed Martin to NCR to Blue Ridge Paper before then going on to a large venture capital firm in New York where his job was to go in as a part of that venture capital team and to look and assess major corporations and to help with the turnaround. He has some amazing track records. So we're really fortunate today to have Jeff Cardell join us to share some key insights on that journey. So Jeff, we're gonna ask Luke to bring up your presentation and we'll be turning it over to you. So, well, thank you. Is there anything else you want the, the group to know about you? Uh, no, I think Jeannie's being kind. You can say I've probably got a little bit more than 25 years. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, 40 years in manufacturing and it's good to see some of my old friends on the on the chat today. So glad to have you on. And, and uh, so look forward to discussing a topic that, uh, that kind of near and dear in my heart is really about engaging, engaging employees. Um, you know, we all work for businesses that do there, there are a wide range of, of, uh, of in industries and, 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 but in, but how many of our people are actually working for the business? You know, we've all heard the old quip that people are our most important asset. But we got to say, are these assets really helping our business thrive or are they just making time? And so that's really what uh, we'd like to talk about today. So next slide, Luke. So employee engagement, how are people engaged? Uh, on the left there, there's a Gallup poll over the last 20 years. And while it may be looking encouraging that uh, we've, got, we've got some increase on the green line and people uh, engaged, it's still disappointing that just over a third of our employees are actually engaged in our business. And we still are hanging around one seventh of the business people are actively disengaged. So 
why do we care? And another Gallup poll here, why do we care our employees are engaged in our business? One, you know, lower absenteeism, as you can read, read through the screen, less turnover, uh, let, uh, a more safe environment, less safety accidents, improved quality. But, you know, down at the bottom there, higher productivity and, and profitability. These are things that make a difference for our business. You know, we, we only have a few leaders, but we have potentially hundreds of other in, uh, customer agents as our employees if we can get these people engaged. So next slide. So question, you know, are your coworkers engaged involving making the business better? And this, uh, as I thought about this, it reminded me of a story. I actually had a, uh, took a leadership class through Lou Holtz and he has a story and I'll try to paraphrase it. He said he walked, he was walking down the street and he met three men on a construction site. He asked the first, what are you doing? And he reported, I am working for five o'clock. He asked the second, what are you doing? I am working for 9.95 an hour. He asked the third, and he said, I am here building a great cathedral whose magnificence will delight and amaze future generations of people. Now, who of these three do you want working for your business? So I ask, and so are, how, are, how are people in your business? Are they entrepreneurs in your business or are they not? So if you would kind of try to jack, uh, try to, chat uh, use the chat function and maybe write down some of your ideas of are your people engaged are they entrepreneurs maybe a few minutes So Cheryl finds in her businesses about a, a third of her people are in her paper company are actually still engaged in the business. I think we, we do find that that you know we do have this 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 percent of people, but that are, that are there to try to help, but are we creating an environment that allows them to flourish and participate? And we have to ask ourselves, why are such a low percentage of our people? And to me, that really is a leadership question. You know, people come to work, that they, uh, the leaders of the business, it is their responsibility to really try to create an environment in which people, uh, people are engaged. If you flip to the next slide. So most companies, in, you know, as we, we said, you know, and, and the stats kind of hold, only utilize a handful of employees to try to drive change, whatever that change is, analyzing the business, selecting, implementing, training, whatever it may be. But great companies have armies of entrepreneurs. Uh, this is a little bit aged. It's a, about a 10-year-old Harvard Business Review article that said Toyota was at that time uh, stating that they were impl implementing, not just receiving, but implementing nine ideas per employee a year. Think of your business, if you had nine to 10 improvements per, to your business for every single employee of your business. So we got to ask ourselves, how do we grow our armies uh, to compete with these kinds of businesses? If we're not, we're not on the path like Toyota to engage our employees, then, then uh, you know, how are we going to compete in this, in this uh, aggressive marketplace? Next slide. So first thing I would, I would recommend for any leader that's trying to engage an army is learn by doing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes by Jefferson is that, you know, we, we may go to classes, we may learn, but we do, do we really learn by, by sitting in our chairs? We really learn by doing things. So leaders create this culture really by finding ways to engage their employees. We find ways to to drive them in, to bring them into the business and give them challenges uh, to make a positive change for our business. And I think the more opportunities we create for our, our employees and our, our coworkers to participate, the more they will, they will, uh, it will drive that culture within our business. Next slide. So we have a couple of options. How are we going to gauge this? Uh, we can do it as an individual or as a group or as a team. And, and especially starting out, I would strongly encourage you to use kind of a team-based framework. 
people in, in a collaboratively uh, collaboratively often be more uh, encouraged to try to take risks, uh, but also to balance that risk and and uh, take uh, uh, take measured steps. So I do encourage find opportunities for groups of people to 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 attack the challenges and opportunities within your business rather than just signing one person and leaving leave them alone on an island. And so I've got a couple of case studies as we go to the next slide and maybe talk about that, maybe give you some ideas. Um, so why do we want to do this? Uh, why do we want to engage our employees? And so we, we, may, we may have the myopic view that they really want to engage employees really just to seize an opportunity or solve a single problem. But I would argue that really in doing this, you get many more other advantages. Actually, by engaging your employees and trying to make things better, they start understanding the need to change. They grow their commitment to the business. They reduce their anxiety uh, of, of, of fear of change. They learn to recognize other problems. Uh, they understand that they, they become better, under, they understand the business better, and they build networks. And uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, what, what I'm going over here is a smoker story. I remember I, at one time I was working for a very large company, actually had about 15,000 employees all at one site, and I was struggling to make a change in the business. I was trying to roll out a new idea that I had. And, and try to make a change. And I had you try to try to uh, try to reach out to some other organizations to try to to build to, to build a need for change. And it actually used my management structure to get this to to uh, to try to gauge more people into into this big change. And I was running into a block wall. Well, I actually was was sharing my frustration with a coworker, and he said he brought to my attention says, you know, I. I, uh, you know, Lockheed, the, the company had implemented a new smokers policy that made all the smokers go outside to stand in the, in the snow and rain uh, to smoke. He says, but I've got a friend that I've met through the smokers network and he works in this other organization. So he introduced me to his friend. So actually by going sideways in the organization, I was able to, to find out to to find out who the real contacts were and actually worked around my bosses and actually came up through both organizations and within a few months was able to start driving positive change within the business. Now I'm not recommending that we all pick up smoking as a, uh, as a habit, but really finding ways in our business to network because we all know it's much easier to get things done if we know the person, if we know the Fred, Mary or Sam that actually does the issue, it's so much easier to get things done. Actually by working in teams, those networks are kind of a natural outcome, outcome of, it, of these, uh, of engaging people in team-based problem solving and team-based improvement within our business. Next slide. Uh, personal case study, this was a company I worked for as a military aircraft. And I took, uh, I'd been challenged to, to work on a tooling problem. We had, we had some components that, uh, for a, a, a complicated uh, manufacturing operation called stretch forming. And we had a, uh, we had a tool that we used to, to uh, do this. And it was about 50 different part numbers. We used this, this, uh, these various tooling assets. And the, and the tool setup took about four to four and a half hours to set up. So it really took about half a day as we changed from one part number to another part number. And I took this challenge as an engineering challenge and I set it by a little cubicle and I designed a new tool that actually would, would, would facilitate 50 different parts would essentially eliminate the changeover as we went from one part number to another part number. However, when I rolled this out to the shop, there was a tremendous amount of resistance. The, the, the equipment just looked different. It didn't, didn't feel the way the same and taste and it did feel the way the same to the employees. And I really had taken a purely engineering approach and I really had, should have taken a more of a holistic people and technical approach. And the, the long, story, long story short, really after about six months, we were able to get uh, the tooling into the organization and make the change. But if, I, but if I had taken a different approach and pulled the people in early versus coming in at the 11th hour with a solution, I probably would have been much more accessible, uh, successful and much uh, faster acceptance of the change within the business. So it just shows the, the, the advantage of, of having engaging people early in any change needs within your business. And okay, next slide. Now here's a more positive uh, change. This actually was another company in which I worked. 
and we were we had a uh, one of our products was uh was we made liquid packaging we we think this may be a a a paper container but this actually was a orange juice container that we actually made we we printed we actually manufactured the paper we, we coated these things and then we printed them now you may think that this is a, a liquid container but really these these containers are really billboards if you go into your grocery store they are an advertisement point and one of the problems we were having is that uh, uh, our sales team kept complaining and then that's what the issue is that our billboard wasn't as effective we were holding the liquid but we we just did not have a very good print quality and so the graphics that that the customer was actually able to apply across their billboard was not as effective so we formed it here we I took a different approach rather than just attacking this as a technical problem. And there were technical issues. We attached this as a, as a human problem as well. And so uh, one thing that made this problem more complicated, we actually had three different manufacturing sites that made the, the step components. We had a paper operation that manufactured the paper. We had a coating operation that, that applied uh, the multi-levels of, of, um, of plastic uh, that actually protected the, uh, the container and then when there was a printing operation it was actually in a third plant bringing them all together we collaboratively worked on this issue and improved the the print quality across the carton now at the time we really hadn't had a lot of complaints about it we just knew we weren't winning the business uh but six months after we had made this change and we you can you can read through the slides the various changes made by the various organizations within six months the number one, uh, our number one customer came to us and remarked about how much better our, our product looked and actually offered after, after some trials actually offered us a hundred percent of their business that, which was, which was a huge, uh, huge win for us. The disadvantage is that we really didn't have enough capacity. So we chose to only take their most profitable business, but we did go from number two to, to number one in this marketplace with this change. And it really was driven not as much by the human side of looking at this thing across the, the, the opportunities in these various parts of business, as well as these technical changes. If I had made any of these changes in any one plant, it wouldn't have worked. It was only a collaboration of the three different groups and the three different plants that actually made the difference here. And so advantage of, of having, even on the technical problems, having people engaged early. Next, next slide. But why has change so hard? Why do people resist change? And uh, one of my favorite books is, uh, it's getting a little bit of age on it by Alan Dutchman. It's called Change or Die. And it says, why do people resist change? Um, all of us kind of grow up and, and uh, you know, we're, we're faced in our life with all kinds of different uh, opportunity to change. And we have, this, we have this in our businesses. Why do people resist this? And, and, when argue, and, and the argument Alan Dutchman makes in his, in his book is that we use an, uh, a wrong model. We use the idea that if we give people enough facts or we, we force them as leaders and tell people you have to do this or your, your job will go away. We'll, so we use fear facts to force as a way to drive change. And Alan Judgment says, really, this is not the right way. This is not the way that we should be driving change in business. And he actually gives three case studies of a heart disease and criminals and, and uh, workers of a failing company to say that that here are three case studies of companies that took a different approach and they use this other model and we'll go to the next slide to talk about it. So we'll go back to the heart disease and heart disease was the one was the, one of the ones for the health it says why do so many people that uh, that are faced with these uh, with this life changing and doctors wonder you know people have a heart attack and they don't change their behavior they use fear facts and forced say, okay, if you don't change, if you don't eat better, you don't change your diet, you don't exercise, then, you know, you could lose your life. And, and the statistics bear out only 15, 20% of people after heart, after a heart attack will actually change their behavior. But there actually was a, a study of a, of, a, of a gentleman, of a physician up in Philadelphia that actually pulled people together and tried a different approach. And he used this other model called the relate, repeat, refrain. And in this model, he brought these healthcare, these, these people that had recent heart attacks and brought them into the hospital and, and introduced them to people that, had, that were successful in changing their habits that he, so they could get people they could relate to. 
and they and through the and through keeping them in the uh, in this environment, they were able to repeat the new behavior. They they had cooks that would provide good food. They gave them exercise opportunities. They started repeating the behavior, and over a period of time, the people's attitudes changed. They're actually able to reframe their behavior. I think as a leader, what we want to look at is that how we use this model. When we want to roll out change, or we want to engage people in our companies to change within our business. Do we do uh, using the fears, facts, and force? We may get 10 to 15 percent of the people to change, but a better way would be to use this model. How do we provide ways to re people to relate to this change? We're going to roll out a new computer system, we're rolling out a new machine, we're rolling out a new process for the way people work. How do we give them opportunities for people to relate to it and then give them time to repeat the behavior? Don't do a single training session. Do multiple sessions. Check back with the new users. Monitor their new, uh, their new, uh, their new processes. Let them repeat the behavior till they reframe to the point where the new way is the preferred way. So as we drive change within our business, I think this is a great model to think about how do we drive and how do we engage our employees in our business. The next slide. So. Kind of, kind of wrap up here. I know we got a short period of time. So leaders, it's really, uh, impend, uh, it's really to their responsibility. If you want to build entrepreneurs, it is the leaders of the business that that uh, that need to do this. And to get started, uh, you know, we need to share our our goals and our problems with our employees. Engage the employees in making the driving the change. Uh, as I mentioned on a slide earlier. There's huge advantages of engaging our employees, much more than just accomplishing a goal. So, but, uh, but uh, uh, effective leaders look to the future and say, how do I engage my people? And they say, not only do I solve this problem, do I actually start building entrepreneurs within my business? I do encourage you on that as, to use a team-based approach, especially in starting out. Uh, people will be, uh, much more measured. They'll also have be more co courageous with their change and more action oriented. I believe in a team uh, environment versus trying to pick people on uh, uh, loner islands and trying to drive drive change. Um, the third bullet. I didn't really talk about this earlier, but using some structured approach. And there is a lot of them out there from the eight D seven step to Mayak, all of them. Uh, using some kind of structured approach can be helpful. Um, didn't really uh, in this short period of time. I did not choose to to add a slide on that. But uh, using some kind of structure in, for the for the team to make positive change within our business to build these entrepreneurs. But on, on a thought process, how do I drive this change? And I would argue use the Alan Dutchman model, the three R's. Provide opportunities for people to relate to the new change, the change there is. Uh, give them opportunities to repeat and not just do a single event uh, of, of rolling out a new change or, or in the business, give them opportunities to repeat, check back with them, and then let that reframe the thinking and change the positive change in the business. As people get more, and going back to the uh, Thomas Jefferson quote, the more people engage in this, the more you'll, they'll be comfortable in driving more positive changes within the business. And then they become the entrepreneurs, not only driving in their own parts of the business, but even reaching out to the customer and doing things like back to the uh, the liquid packaging or the, or the orange juice carton where we actually made a change not in the business, but actually made improvements for the customer and the customer recognized and actually grow our business. And this is really what we're looking for with our business. So the, to me, the, really the key point here is that leadership, we have to provide opportunities if we want to build these entrepreneurs, set the goals, provide those opportunities and start engaging our employees. So the question I throw back out to the to the group here is, how do you create these opportunities? What can you do at your business to build you an entrepreneurial company or an entrepreneurial army at your business? And if you would, you know, if you want to try to uh, drop a few ideas back in chat, and I would appreciate it. So we got uh, brainstorming sessions or an opportunity to get, get people to, to engage and think.
I know I've worked with some of you in the before. Uh, one of the advantages, one of the, the quips is you wait 10 seconds of silence and people will fill it up. So we're going to wait a few seconds to see if we can get somebody to type into chat. Thank you, Steve. Great model. I know Steve's been very successful up in up in uh, the Charlotte, North Carolina area in driving change within his business. Another good idea by Steve, you know, starting small, um, a small projects and then grow from there. Um, Elise brought up the idea of uh, rewarding ideas. So, you know, create, creating a positive environment. Um, you know, uh, we, we come to work, it's, there's much more to work than just uh, uh, the transaction of getting paid. It is, a, it, is a, um, it is a social network. So creating a environment in which people, we reward people to, to, uh, to do this, uh, to engage into the business and reward those uh, is a good idea by Elise. So Aliana's uh, had, had encouraged and support um, on what not to what to do rather than how. Just give them a what and let them uh, drive to the change. I think that's a good point. Let let people give them a creative space in which to work. Uh, as leaders, we can sometimes be a little prescriptive. Thou shalt do this way. That doesn't really engage employees. Uh, it's often better to give them a goal, maybe some kind of guide framework, but let them use their own creativity and initiative to come up with ideas. This, this really engages people much more than just, just the go-do method. Good point, Aldiana. So I, I know we're about running out of time. I didn't want to, uh, um, and I know people's time are, are valuable and we don't want to to run too much past our time, but thank you for your time today. And hopefully uh, look forward to working with y'all again in the future. Thank you, Jeff, wonderful insights. And um, I'm inspired now, I want to go out and build a team of entrepreneurs or what we called an army of entrepreneurs. And uh, how fun would that work environment be, right? If you think about the, you think about the garage mahal and all the concepts that we think of with entrepreneurs and the fun they have and, the hard work that goes into growing a business. So I love the spirit of that. I love your tips. Thank you so much for your concepts today. So as you're thinking about other ways to be inspired, uh, please join us again for another one of our webinars coming up. We've got uh, one coming up soon on uh, boards, uh, the board or the executive director, who's in charge. Glenda Hicks will be leading that on April the 30th. We also have a session coming up on May 14th around the future of work. We've had a Foresight Scout team looking at the trends all around the world and uh, analyzing kind of the lead indicators of what will be with the future of work now that we've gone through so much with the pandemic and so much of the shift to a hybrid work environment. What does that look like? So we'll be talking about their results of their research effort on May the 14th and in June, uh, we're going to be talking about tips for launching an effective strategy design as people think about going into the fall and into next year and then finishing up in June with the frictionless customer experience. So um, please join us for other inspirational sessions. And if you know of a great speaker, we'd love to hear from you on that as well. So have a great afternoon, everyone. And again, thanks to Jeff Cardell and all of his tips for today. We'll see you again soon. Bye now.